working. That should be live. I'm going to check on that. Click. Testing audio. Okay. We are good. Do we test Twitch? Yep. Twitch is okay. on and live. Okay. You ready? Yep. You ready? All right. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 281, the last one of 2021 here on the In Th Security Podcast on the In30 Network. I'm Hiam. Tom is over there. Hi. Now, now, if you're listening to this, you probably have COVID. I don't have COVID. I don't think Tom has COVID. I don't. But I think everyone, I think everyone else does. It is really bad out there. So if you are listening to this, Hopefully you're virtual. You don't have to go into the office. If you're going to the office, I think it's time to bust out the the, the N95 masks, the double masking. Get your booster. Get vaccinated if you're not. I don't know what else to tell you. So just be safe out there. Try not to uh, lick any doorknobs. It's generally frowned upon in the medical community. Mm, I've been told. My kids that. <laughs> like, I literally tell my kids that. And they're like, but why not? Like, wh why? Why do I have to tell you this? Because you don't. Okay, so, so I mean, we were just going to have an easy show of, of the just recap of the year because I guess everyone's bored and they want that. But I, I just, I guess we should start off with, you had some more Log4J news? Yeah, there were a couple more CVEs to come out of Log4J. Nothing quite as earth-shattering as the first big one, um, but, you know... Go ahead and patch if if you know what log4j is. If you're a software development using uh, software developer using Java, uh, yeah, just upgrade to the the latest and greatest version. Um, you know, for for those of you playing at home who aren't software developers and have no idea what log4j is, I just make sure your stuff's up to date. So not really a ton to go into here, but yeah, the the rabbit hole on that exploit keeps getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I guess that's the theme for this whole year. The whole year has been a corporate sort of threats, not really targeting individuals, but they target individuals through the corporate network because I guess it's easier to get money from corporate than from an individual. So if you yeah. don't know what Log4j is, just I guess if you do, just make sure you bill your hours. That's what you said. How should yeah. I prevent it? Log your hours. <laughs> the... Uh... Yeah, the one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot more like ransomware and stuff hit businesses, um, in addition to individuals, individual attacks do still happen. But why it's kind of it seemed like it shifted over to the more corporate enterprise side for attacks is corporations generally have bigger pocketbooks. They are more sensitive to disruptions, right? Like if you hit an individual, there's a decent chance the person's just going to say, "Ah, eh, whatever. I never liked this computer anyway," and they're just going to go buy a new one, right? Um, or or solve the problem some other way with a family member or what have you. But a business, when you attack a business and you stop their their flow of revenue and you stop production, you know, getting that back operational in a cheap way or a cheaper way without paying a ransom can be really expensive. So when you do the dollars to dollars comparison of, hey, do we pay this ransom and then unlock our stuff or do, you know, the morally right thing and we don't pay somebody that is trying to extort us, you know, more often than not, the balance is actually going to work out to, yeah, paying paying the person trying to extort you. It might be cheaper, easier, better for your customers, better for your business longevity. Uh, it's terrible for everyone else because you're basically rewarding these people for being reprehensible. But yeah, cost of doing business, I guess. Uh, welcome to a capitalist society. Like I, I'm not sure what to tell you, but yeah, bigger pocketbooks, uh, better chance of a, a payout. Yeah, you're going to attack the things that give you the biggest chance, right? Why in the, the mid-90s did virus makers concentrate on Microsoft Windows and not Linux or Mac? Well, because Windows was 99% of the PCs out there, 99% of the computers out there. You're not going to waste your time at attacking the smallest portion of the pie. You're going to go for the biggest slice you can. I, I was going to say, I think now, I think there was some government order that insurance companies cannot pay the ransomware and coupled with the insurance companies dropping people for ransomware payouts. 
it's one of those things you want to talk about capital society. Now the insurance companies are not paying the payouts. It's like, we're not going to cover this. Um, and I, I find that funny. It's sad, but I find that funny. And I think it's, it's, I'm hoping that over this year, again, the people who listen to this are not, are not the people we're trying to talk to, but you're starting to see more people starting to care about some sort of privacy, some sort of, I got to be careful. Um, with that said, it's I still see people clicking randomly and and not following rules, but maybe maybe they're slightly better, and I guess that's all I can ask for is just slightly better. Saying should I click this link, whatever it is. But again, the the whole thing of the story was pay us for illegal I- issues, and I just want to start in the beginning. So the first thing we ha- heard in the beginning, right at the end of 2020 into 2021, was Solar Winds. Right, that was the very first thing. It was Solar Winds. It was this uh, large private company that had everyone on, with their uh, federal contractors and somebody got, oh, it was FireEye. That's what it was. It was FireEye that noticed something, had their tools leaked, and it was because SolarWinds, another company, was was having issues. And so they developed something and they found out that all these companies, and I think they they attributed it to the Russians. I mean, I don't know if that's definitive, but they attributed it to the Russians. And that was the very first big leak. And we thought that was the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of shed a light on the security of the supply chain, uh, which, you know, uh, amazingly enough, has come back now with Log4j, with these various, uh, you know, dependency CVEs that are, that are popping up now. Uh, it, supply chain security seems to be the theme for 2021. Um, so yeah, just like beginning of the year, we're talking about solar winds. We're talking about, Hey, here's this thing that you add as a layer onto your business to help with, you know, monitoring and automation and all this stuff. And, oh no, it got popped. And now it's literally sitting in the middle of your network with access to everything. Cause that's what the tool does. Uh, and now log for J, right? Hey, here's some logging middleware to add to your applications to solve a really common and boring problem. Oh no, that got popped. And now it's literally sitting in the middle of your application stack on anything and everything you have that runs Java is more than likely going to be using Log4j and it's vulnerable. So, okay, now we have to deal with that. Um, in, in software development, there's, there's kind of this, this tug of war between two ideologies. And I, I constantly find myself on both sides of this debate. Uh, and it can switch per project or per programming language, but I'm, I'm constantly fighting with myself on whether or not you have a bunch of dependencies to make development faster, right? Because you have a lot of little plugins, a lot of little libraries, and you can iterate and build upon these things really quickly because it's not like you're building a car from scratch, right? Like if you want to build a car, well, okay, I'm going to get some axles, I'm going to get a transmission, I'm going to get some tires and an engine, and you know, I'm going to slap all this stuff together and make a car instead of, okay, well, First, I need to grow a rubber tree, and then I need to harvest rubber from that and then cast that into tires uh, and doing everything from scratch, which is harder, but you get a more bespoke solution out of it. So there's this constant tug of war in software development between using a, like as few dependencies as humanly possible for your given project or speeding up development and using whatever you can off the shelf open source. Um, And the issue with using everything you can is it increases your attack surface. Uh, So now, you know, the the no dependency side of the house has got Log4j and SolarWinds and all these other boons, really, all these other problems that happened in 2021 on their side of the argument, which is, hey, try to just simplify, right? If you're not going to need it, don't build it. Don't integrate it. Don't add on top of it. Build the exact thing you need and not a bit more. The problem is in your example, and I understand why you said it, you're still growing the rubber tree. Like, yes. While, while, while you're clearing out Log4j, your rubber tree is still 20 years from growing. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. You want to come up. A friend of mine asked me, hey, how long would it be if I learned to program? I want to program my own app. I know nothing about programming. How long will it take? I said five, 10 years. Like honestly, five, 10 years. If you want to start from scratch. Or you can hire somebody, or you can pay pay somebody who has a competing app and and pay somebody to modify it from there. But then you're dependent, like you said, on them. 
And that's the problem. It's you want to be up and running. You need something. You can't hire a whole security team. You can't hire a whole team. So you you outsource it or you do something. And now that gets hosed and you're stuck. But I think at the end of the day, it's I, I think it's it's easier to use these middle uh, these middle these mi- these middle companies. But still, you got to be careful. Yeah, and, and not not to say that you know growing your own software from the ground up and not using anything is inherently safer, right? It does decrease the amount of attack surface you get by adding dependencies, but the trade-off there is that, hey, guess what? You built all of it yourself, you're now responsible for it all yourself. So if you're doing stuff like authentication or building an OAuth stack or signature verification, or or if you're building your own custom logger that happens to use JNDI object, uh, object lookups, yeah, guess what? Those things could be vulnerable, but now there's not a vendor or, or a library out there saying, please upgrade to this version. You need to now figure out, are you vulnerable in the thing you built? How do I test this? How do I verify that this is good? And if it's not good, how do I fix it? Right? Because you are now responsible for everything, you have to be responsible for everything. Uh, meaning that your solutions to problems aren't necessarily going to be very straightforward. So it's a very multifaceted question, and honestly, there's not really right answers. Uh, for me personally, I fall on the the side of, hey, unless something is really critical or complicated, I'm just going to build it myself. Now, when it comes to things like authentication or cryptography, I will use the standard library. I will use the 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 library that is battle hardened and tested and used by big companies and like. The Go standard library's got stuff for hashing. Am I going to write my own hasher? No. It's it's right there. It's on the shelf. It's battle tested and people have proven it works. We're going to use that. Um, Log4j was one of those technologies, though. Log4j was a known good. This is just the thing you use. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, it had problems. Well, I have, that I have a problem with. This is the thing you use. and And I know what you're trying to say, but I get the... Oh, everyone says that this is the best software, so I'm going to use it without doing our research. Or we're so loyal to this this way of doing something. When someone comes, I guess, and their word is disrupts it, we say, "Oh, we can't. We, we have this new thing." Well, no, the new thing can't be as good. And so I I I get nervous when companies get so big like that. And this is the way to do it, but no one is no one's auditing and checking and doing everything else because this is the way you do it. Um, but but I can see that you're a small business. You don't have to. You, you're you're a plumber and you want to charge people online and have an online booking system. Your job is to plumb. Your job is not to set up all this. So you hire people to to do that for you. And unfortunately. You hired some. You hire. You hired, and you got software that had a problem. Now it's up to that team to fix it. And I think that's the fixing part is the important thing. And and I think people have to, have to handle that. And now we see that. Uh, do we want to move on? Yeah, I think so. A bit rot is uh, a real thing. So as time goes on, you know, new vulnerabilities will be found. Software, unfortunately, can never be static. And that's what people don't want to deal with. You don't want to, we don't want to, we, we don't want to take something that's working and say, Hmm, we should, we should add more features or whatever. We have to go look at it. Um, I guess the next thing that came up was I think the exchange bug, the Microsoft exchange bug that they're still fixing. So I think that came out February or March. So everyone, everyone in corporate uses Microsoft exchange. Uh, the actual, the actually the U S government found an issue that, that bad actors were exploiting it. I don't exactly know what the attack was, but it was bad that that the that the federal government was sending sending companies requests with exchange, please fix this, please upgrade, please do this. And again, it's a you have to now go upgrade all your systems and people don't want to do it. And exchange isn't really a, a trivial piece of software. There there are job titles out there uh, titled exchange administrator. Uh, and the larger companies have tons of them on staff just to keep their email and calendars flowing. Uh, it's it's not a trivial job. So yeah, upgrading Exchange, it's not like you go and grab the latest version of Firefox or Chrome and you just hit the restart Exchange button. No, it's, it's actually a full take downtime kind of upgrade. And for a system as critical as email and calendaring, 
Yeah, it's not easy to find that time either. And unfortunately, so what I love is people tell me, oh, well, I'll just move to the latest and greatest protocol. I hear Gmail is good without with Gmail's sync or whatever. We're just going to move the company. And it's like, no, that's the problem. Maybe you can move, but you have to be careful with everything. And Microsoft has a track record as generally a good track record of these things. So, so people move to exchange Microsoft. And then with you, when you have exchange, you have office 365, again, more software that you need. So they were on good terms and then they had this, this bug and I don't remember Microsoft's response being all that good other than, yeah, you should patch or putting out updates. You should patch, which doesn't help, but whatever, that, that's what you have to do. Yeah. The, uh, I forgot about this one. I'm actually, I'm scrolling through, uh, in 30.net where you can find this and all other episodes we do. Um, I completely forgot about, uh, the gas line ransomware. Remember when oh, that, that, was hit? That, was, that was a huge deal. Well, that was the, that was going to be the next story. Uh, so we had the Colonial Pipeline, and we found and we found out that capitalism wins again. It was the pipe the pipeline itself, not the infrastructure. The company got hacked. The gas was still flowing, but they they wanted to make sure their customers were accurately billed and not to have mistakes. So they temporarily slowed or shut down the pipeline to deal with it. But then as the, as the year went by, we found out that the FBI was monitoring it and they actually had the encryption key and they were a little, and people were pissed, like, how come, how come, how come? And the FBI said, Hey, uh, we don't want to burn this asset. We didn't want to burn this asset. We wanted to catch the people. And the good news is they did. They actually caught the, they caught a, many of the people. They, they got the majority of the money back, but that was, again, that was this huge thing that would have been the entire year, but we're only on the third story. Uh, it, the, the past few years have been interesting in some of the worst ways. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe a lot of good novels here in, like, 20 years will be written about the, the past two to three years of humanity here. Um, but, yeah, that, that got into, like, some, some odd intersections of real world and um in the internet world right because this this you know gang of of roving thugs on the net were attacking companies and getting ransomware payments and then they hit this one company and there were actually gas shortages in the area uh where this this pipeline serviced and it's not because they shut it down or slowed the pipeline it's because the story hit the newswire. People panicked. They had a run on the gas stations. They filled up every container they possibly could, including putting gasoline and Rubbermaid totes in the back of their car. Don't do that. By the way. That's that was actually fake. That, no, no, that was actually that was that fake. Was actually okay, fake. good. Yeah, that was fake. thankfully. <laughs> well, for the, some of the images that we saw were found. It was, happened in Mexico during one of their gas shortages. Okay, and of course. And of course, the new, the media and Twitter and and your your uncle and my uncle decided to spread, <laughs> and then and then now me on the podcast. So okay, well that's yeah. good. But people had a run on gas during the news stories, and they would fill up everything they could with gasoline, causing a shortage. And then the pipeline that had been slowed down or shut off in some cases also compounded to that problem because they couldn't just backfill everything. Like it was, it was a major issue. And even the thugs themselves, the thieves themselves said, Hey, we, we didn't mean to attack a, a gas pipeline. We're not political. This isn't what we do. We just, we just rip people off. Um, and, and like by that time, the feds are already involved. So there's nothing you, you can do as a thief. Like you're just, you're I mean, that's refreshingly honest. I, I do <laughs> like that. We, we don't need to hurt people. We just want money. We don't care who it is. We yeah. just want your money. <laughs> money. We want green. We want greenbacks. I don't care how we get it, but that's what we want. Yeah, they're like the the Lex Luthor of of ransomware people, right? They're like, look, we we don't really care about politics or anything. We just want to kill Superman and make a lot of money. That's it. That's why we're here. I mean, the the good story that came out of that was two things. One, the federal government is really starting to look at crypto uh, crypto ra uh, sp rings and. They, they did start shutting down. They did catch the Revil gang, the Conti gang, and some of these. And, and they are jumping back up. They're, we're playing whack-a-mole. But for the most part, 
the, the I guess it's the CIA. I don't know who deals with this. Is starting to catch them, and I don't know if they're bringing them to justice, but at least taking them down. The other good thing that it made the news, and people started hearing the things of what is this? What is this Bitcoin one, which we're going to talk about, and two, how do I protect myself? Which started, which was a huge good thing at that point. Yeah, and we're the, in March. Yeah. <laughs> the the great thing about you know kind of security in interesting time, especially when people are bored or otherwise doom scrolling, is that yeah, there can be some incidental education, right? There's a lot of fear mongering in that. There's there's probably more bad than good, honestly, but some of those people did start looking at computer security in kind of a curious manner, right? What What is crypto ransomware? What are they ransoming? Do they have, like, uh, magazine letters cut out and they stuffed in an envelope and, like, slid it under somebody's door? Like, is it that kind of ransom? And, uh, you know, asking a lot of inquisitive questions, which is great to see. I've had family members that are extremely non-technical, right? Like, turning on the cable TV box is the maximum amount of effort they've ever given to any piece of technology. And even that's a stretch to get them to do it correctly. But they were now asking me, hey, this pipeline thing, what happened? What is a Bitcoin? How can I Bitcoin? Did they, did somebody like kidnap someone? Is that the ransom? And uh, it was, it was great to just have a frank conversation about how the internet has grown up and, uh, you know, some pieces are, are getting better and some pieces are getting a whole lot more dangerous. And then I think in April, NFTs became a thing, I think. I mean, they were before, but I think that's when I started really hearing about them. It's, it's so reached we critical have, mass in 2021. We, we've heard that uh, you could take a picture that you can right-click and save on, and now that's yours for a bazillion dollars. Oh, no, it's not, Tom, no, no, it's not yours. You can right-click and save that picture, but the thing that's actually yours is... You, t you write your name on the receipt that has the URL of that image on it, and you, you write it in there, and that's your NFT. You're quite literally paying for your CVS receipt of the thing you bought, but you don't get the thing you bought. You just get the receipt. Well, I, I was telling Tom before the show, I really like the idea of of the idea of an NFT. It's I don't want to hold this item, but I want to... I want to say that I own it. And Tom's like, you could just buy the museum or donate to the museum or something else. And then I like the DAOs, which will, which I, I like those, the constitution DAO and the shared ownership until they did it all wrong. Like, I really like the idea. Um, I was intrigued with the Wu-Tang album anyway, which by the way is in the NFT people's hands, but, but that's what it first came at that we really first heard about it and it just spiraled out of control. Now all these things are worth s some obscene amount of money, but there's no centralized place because that's the definition of it. And there's no like real cost. People are pumping and dumping them. But the idea that you can own the receipt to some digital artwork really became a thing in 2021. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, I, I think we'll get into this as we, we get through more stories. But yeah, cryptocurrencies, yeah, got even bigger in 2021. Enough so that my grandmother was asking me about random... I'm, I'm going to call them one-off coins because this is a, a G or PG rated podcast. But random coins. Uh, and hey, grandson, should I invest in this rando coin? Should I buy in 30 coin? And uh, no, the answer is always no. I mean, if you would like an in 30 coin, I will tell you to join our signal group, which by the way, we have. And we will take the pulse of the room and see if the in 30 coin is a thing. We will add it to our whole list of free services that we offer, such as... Uh, what do we have? We have free credit monitoring. We do. I was going to do a VPN, but I have no basis for it. Like I wasn't going to log, but I wasn't going to do anything either. You tell me the website and I'll take a screenshot and send it to you. We, uh, we also do uh, functions as a service. So if you send us a mathematical function, we will copy and paste that into Wolfram Alpha and then send you the result. Uh, that's, that's another one of the great features we offer. Oh, and identity theft protection. We can't forget oh, we about do, that. Do I, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do do identity theft. We also do. Is this code written well? Because my students give me lots of garbage code, and we have lots of arguments on whether it's good. 
Um, okay, so now we're in the summer at some point, and I don't know. It was just a lot of a lot of stuff coming through, mainly scams. And then we get to the winter, and I do want to point this out. In October, the Wu Tang Clan album got bought by an NFT group, so there is hope that we will hear it. There is hope that we will hear it. So, so we still have that. Next, I don't know. Uh, was there something before Log4j? Uh, there was Western Digital. Western Digital Western had a Di- bug that uh, allowed uh, attackers to completely wipe your internet connected hard drive. So that wasn't great. And I, I'm just thinking these are all like each one of these stories would be months and months and months. And they were just, a week. yeah, but it got really quiet. So it got, it was like these buildups. And then all of a sudden it was quiet. It was just crypto ransomware, crypto ransomware, and then huge issues. And then I think, uh, more crypto ransomware. And then we had, Oh, there's the print nightmare. That was all year. Microsoft oh, yeah. had a bug in its, pr- its print spooler that they could never fix. And and it's still not fixed, but we had that. Uh, air tags, and I'm partial to air tags because I love air tags. Now, all of a sudden, Apple makes a device that's actually good and can track things. And people are like, hey, is it's tracking me. And Apple's like, we did everything in our power. Look, I'm partial. I'm biased because I know, I know people who worked on it. So I don't want to uh, go too much in there. But I thought all of a sudden Apple does something right, and now it's a problem. Nobody complained about Tile or trackers or anything else. And then we, I don't know. I mean, other than the, I'm trying to think of anything else that no. And then, and then finally it was Log4j. And then, oh, we're going to end with LastPass. So let's just go straight to LastPass. Yeah. So so our final story that happened last week. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there were people on Twitter saying that they had received emails from LastPass saying that somebody in countries other than the one they were currently sitting in had tried to access their LastPass vault using the correct master password. Now, this is like hair on fire, you know, severity one, like top of the mind. This is the worst of the worst thing that can happen if you have a password manager is somebody gets your master password and they get it right. So hopefully you have two factor. But if you don't, the only thing they need is that master password. And a lot of people were getting these all of a sudden. It was very odd. Um, And people were reporting, Okay, well, if it did happen, it might have been from a like a LastPass breach forever ago where they didn't get passwords, but they're able to use like other passwords that they had gotten from other breaches and then did a credential stuffing attack and then got in that way. Uh, other people are saying, no, my password vault password is completely unique. It's completely random. It's the only thing I use for this one application. Why did somebody get this? Um, and it turns out that LastPass gave a, I'm going to call it a subpar response. Um, as, as far as root cause analyses go, it was a lot of hand-waving, a lot of apologies, and very scant technical details. But it looks like their monitoring system went off the rails and sent out these emails in mistake. Nobody was actually logging in. No one was doing anything with it. It, it was just a weird monitoring mistake with their emails. But that's kind of concerning. The more concerning thing to me is that they didn't just come out and say this. How did, how did they work this? Uh, they, they said, um, our investigation, here's a quote from the, the tweet they put out. The, uh, it's also on blog.lastpass.com if you want to check it out. Um, our investigation has since found that some of these security alerts, which were sent to a limited subset of LastPass users, were likely triggered in error. As a result, we have adjusted our security alert system and this issue has since been resolved. Okay, cool. So that's the root cause. That's what they say happened. Now, the were likely triggered an error. That word likely is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, and I don't like to see that in root cause analysis documents. Uh, more than that, I want to know the actual details. How did this happen? And what, what this note is telling me is that you know, LastPass is either not being very forthcoming with the information they have, or they don't have information to become to to you know be forthcoming with, um, which would be even more concerning. Um, you know, do I think LastPass is breached? Do I think it's unsafe? Do I think you should move? 
No, not necessarily. Um, I, I think this is a badly written RCA. Um, it's very apologetic. It, it is somewhat transparent, but there needs to be more meat on these bones. There needs to be more technical details here. Like, I can come up with a lot of different ways on how these words map to a technical picture in my mind, but you don't want your users to have to do that. Come out and say, here's our alerting stack, here's how it works, here's the bug we had, and here's why it got tripped. That's it. Like, people are going to understand. You just have to be honest and open with it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think their response was bad, but I don't think it was very good either. Do, I'm looking now who wrote it, because I think the person who, the initial people who founded LastPass knew what, that's how they would have come out. Uh, when uh, when Project Zero, the Google Project Zero blog, um, found all these issues. They were right on top of it. They were working with everything else. And I'm looking, this is not, I, I can't remember his name, who, uh, who, who was the CEO of LastPass, but I feel like he should have been out here writing this instead of, yeah. instead this of is, whoever wrote this. this is and the I think VP, it's part of the log me in thing. This is the VP of LastPass product development. LastPass themselves are going through some weird turmoil. Right? Like they were acquired from lo uh, by Logmian, and then they just recently announced that they're going independent again. I, it's it's kind of odd. Like I personally have moved to Bitwarden because after Logmian bought LastPass, well, they've bought a lot of things that I've fallen in love with over the years and ruined nearly all of them. So I moved to Bitwarden because I didn't want the same thing to happen to my password name. Um, and I've dealt with their support a few times and it's been very, very poor since the acquisition. Hopefully that gets better. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd rather pay a company that really puts their money where their mouth is and open sources just about everything there is to open source. And that's Bitwarden. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I feel very conflicted about this. Like I, I, on one hand, no other company would go to the effort to be this transparent. Some of them would just say, oops, sorry, an error happened, our bad. Um, on the other hand, as far as like transparent root cause analysis documents go, this is very poor. It is very poor. And Well, again, I'm with you. I, I think we told everyone last year to move to Bitwarden. We actually did. We like it. Um, if you were on LastPass, I would not be, I saw this and I said, I'm not worried. Um, if you, if you can move to Bitwarden, that would be our suggestion, but last pass is fine. And we, yeah. we've had enough talks on which one you should use. The problem is now they're all costing, starting to cost some real money. Um, it's, it used to be $30. It used to be $12 a year. And now it's something like $50 a year for your family. That's starting to get a lot for somebody who may not care. And it's starting and, to be a lot for about... storing, you know, less than five megs of data per user. And five megs yeah. is an awful lot of text to throw in an encrypted base on. And so it's just, it's, it's, I get it. They're doing all this other stuff, but I feel like it's very hard for me to justify to my parents or my grandparents that I have to move, that they need this when Chrome or Firefox or Edge does this. And there's a whole bunch of other things. And the, the notepad next to their computer looks awfully nice. So, or to reuse it because they haven't been hacked yet. Anyway, we are way over time, but. Are I you ready? Wanna, is there any, are you ready for ready the for? hot take? This is the hot okay. take of the end of the year. Okay. I, I am going to defend the notebook sitting next to the computer. A notebook okay, that even says ahead. passwords on the front of it. I am about to defend it. Now, is it a good security practice to write down your password? No. Is it a good security practice to put them on sticky notes on your monitor? No. Is it a good security practice to write them down in a notebook and sit next to your keyboard? No. But is it better than having passwords.doc on your desktop? Yes. Absolutely. And yes. Here's, here's the reason. This right here, this is not hackable. This is not digital. It sits here on the desk and no one can get to it unless they walk in this place grab this notebook and start flipping through it. Now, if I have passwords.doc on my desktop, anybody who can access my system can access that document. But this offline, stupid, boring notebook, somebody has to physically break into my house to get this. Now, 
Could it happen? Sure. Does it happen? Yeah, it has. But is it very likely compared to just a drive-by attacker who happens to find a passwords document? No. So, well, if you can't get people to to use a password manager, if you can't get them to, you know, use unique passwords or or anything like that, the notebook isn't a terrible idea. It's not a great idea, but it is better than nothing. No, I I I absolutely agree. Look, it's it's the sticky notes on the monitor are not as good, but the 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 intersection of criminals who are going to rob your house to get your passwords book and the digital criminals who are going to go to your house to get that don't intersect. Yeah, it's so the Venn diagram is two separate circles. So so yes, you you are good there. It's look, should you have a safe with all should you have a safe under your bed that contains all your jewelry? It's better than telling everyone. It's better than telling them where it is, but it's better than not having a spot for it type thing. It, it's one of those. So, so yes, if that's the way to go, then that's fine. As long as you keep unique passwords, that, that's the key. Unique separate passwords and you know how to long as long as you can do whatever you need to do. But yes, I, I, I agree with you on that statement. And that's, that's all I've got. That's my hot take for the year. Feel free to join our signal group and yell at me and tell me how wrong I am. Uh, it is not the first time I've been yelled. No, we're both here and just message us on Twitter at in 30 and we will get you in. With that said, it's been a long year. I, I don't think 2022 is getting any better anytime soon, but we can all hope. So I don't know. With that said, everyone have a good New Year's and we will see you in the coming year. Have a good night. See you, everyone. All right, let me turn off Twitch.